In the annals of Malaysian criminal history, few cases have left as indelible a mark as that of Mona Fandi. Her journey from aspiring pop singer to notorious murderer is a chilling tale of ambition, superstition, and ultimately, depravity. Mona Fandi, born Masnar Ishmael, entered the world on January 10, 1956, in the small town of Kangar, Perlis, Malaysia. Raised in a humble household, Mona's early years were characterized by a desire for fame and fortune. Since a young age, she was known for her singing and dancing skills. Inspired by the burgeoning entertainment industry of the 1970s, she harbored dreams of becoming a successful singer. Mona Fandi adopted her stage name inspired by her husband's name, Muhammad Noor Afandi Abdul Rahman. Mona's aspirations eventually led her to Kuala Lumpur, where she began performing at local events and weddings, slowly building a modest following. Mona's husband heavily invested in her career. He arranged several TV appearances for her, which helped her gain visibility in the industry. In 1987, she released her debut album titled Diana. This marked her official entry into the Malaysian music industry. While her music career was slow to pick up, it was Mona's fascination with the occult that would ultimately shape her destiny. Intrigued by tales of black magic and mysticism, she delved into the world of witchcraft, seeking power and influence beyond the realm of music. She embraced her newfound identity as a witch doctor, offering her services to those seeking wealth, success, and protection from harm. This ultimately led to her execution in 2001. This video is intended for mature audiences and is not suitable for minors. It contains graphic content related to a criminal investigation, including detailed descriptions and depictions of a violent crime. This content may be disturbing for some viewers. Viewer discretion is strongly advised. Now, let's find out what happened. Mona's transition from singer to witch doctor was swift and unsettling. Fueled by word of mouth and sensationalized media coverage, she became involved in spiritual witchcraft activities and was known as a BOMO, a local shaman. She quickly cultivated a following of devotees who sought her services for various rituals and ceremonies. Her clients ranged from desperate individuals seeking love spells to wealthy businessmen hoping to secure lucrative deals. She also claimed to have provided politician clients in the ruling UMNO party with a variety of charms and talismans for a hefty price. Mona's purported ability to communicate with supernatural beings and cast powerful spells garnered her a devoted following, elevating her to a position of prominence within Malaysia's occult community. Operating from her home in Kuala Lumpur, Mona conducted elaborate rituals and ceremonies, often accompanied by her husband, Afandi, and their assistant, Juremi Hassan. Together, they cultivated an aura of mystique and intrigue, drawing in curious seekers from all walks of life. Little did she know, the final price was her to pay. On July 2, 1993, Politician Maslin Idris from the ruling UMNO party approached Mona and her husband about a witchcraft treatment, hoping that her supposed supernatural abilities would help enhance his political career. Unbeknownst to him, Mona and her accomplices had far more sinister intentions. They promised to help Maslin by giving him a talisman consisting of a cane and a songcock supposedly owned by Sukarno, the first president of Indonesia. In return, Mona demanded 2.5 million ringgit. Maslin paid the couple 500,000 as a deposit and gave them 10 land titles as surety for the remaining 2 million ringgit. An appointment was made for cleansing rituals, and Mona lured him to her secluded farmhouse on the outskirts of Kuala Lumpur. She invited Maslin to a ritual where he was told to lie on a candlelit bathroom floor, with his eyes closed while Mona placed an orchid on his forehead. He was told to wait for the money to drop from the sky. When Maslin fell asleep, Mona brought out an axe and ordered Hassan to kill him. Later in court, Hassan admitted to chopping his head with three blows and ultimately killing him in cold blood. Dr. Abdul Rahman Yusuf, who had conducted the official autopsy, gave witness during the trial that there were no defensive wounds on the body. He believed the victim was in a lying position on the ground when the fatal blows were struck. They then dismembered his body and buried the remains beneath the floorboards of their home.
Maslin Idris was reported missing on July 2, 1993, after withdrawing almost 300,000 ringgit from various banks in Kuala Lumpur. He was last seen meeting Mona at Raub, Pahang. Soon after Maslin's disappearance, Mona was reported to have gone on a shopping spree in Kuala Lumpur where she bought a new Mercedes-Benz and also bought a new cell phone, gold jewelry, sofas, kitchen cabinets, a TV, and a video recorder, and even got a facelift, all paid for in cash. Plastic surgeon Dr. Wong Kang Shen confirmed that he had performed 13,000 ringgit worth of cosmetic procedures on Mona during a five-hour operation on 15 July 1993. This raised suspicions as her spending was inconsistent with her known income. The discovery of Maslin Idris's mutilated body triggered a nationwide manhunt for Mona Fandi and her accomplices. On July 22, 1993, two days after the body of Maslin was found, Mona, her husband and their assistant were arrested in Bentong and Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Fandi was apprehended by police while attempting to flee the country disguised as a man. Mona's trial commenced in August 1993. The trial was held at the Temelo High Court and was conducted by a seven-person jury, which has since been abolished in Malaysia from 1 January 1995. The trial lasted from August 1993 all the way to February 1995. During the trial, prosecutors presented a total of 70 witnesses and 295 exhibits. Throughout her trial, Mona Fandi displayed a unique and unconventional attitude. She was often seen in high spirits, perpetually grinning, and willingly posing for the media's cameras. Her daily attire was flamboyant, characterized by vibrant and colorful patterns. Reports suggest that she took pleasure in the attention she received during her widely publicized case. At one juncture, she even declared, it seems I have a large fanbase. Mona maintained her innocence, insisting that her actions were guided by supernatural forces beyond her control. However, mental health does not appear to have been a significant factor in Mona's trial. On October 23, 1994, the trial began for Mona's assistant and accomplice Juremi Hassan. While defending himself in court, he questioned the validity of his own statements made during his arrest. He alleged that he was coerced into confessing through physical abuse and threats. Hassan further claimed that the police manipulated him into pleading guilty by offering a lighter sentence if he testified against his co-defendants. However, the court dismissed these allegations, reasoning that if Hassan had indeed been mistreated, he would have lodged a complaint immediately rather than waiting until his trial several months later. Mona and her husband's trial began on November 16, 1994. She alleged that she was subjected to harsh treatment during her questioning at the Bukit Amman police headquarters in July 1993. She claimed that the officers intentionally inflicted pain on her by pressing on her recent plastic surgery stitches. Mona also stated that she was made to sign three blank sheets of paper daily while in detention. However, Detective Takbir Ahmad Nazir Mahanmad countered this by stating that Mona had voluntarily signed all 33 pages of her caution statement upon its completion. After considering the arguments, the court concluded that Mona's statements were given willingly and thus, could be used as evidence. Due to the overwhelming evidence presented by the prosecution, including eyewitness testimonies and forensic analysis, left little doubt as to their guilt. According to some reports, besides financial gain, the motive of the premeditated gruesome murder was revenge over a land deal that had gone sour. On February 9, 1995, Mona Fandi, Mod Afandi Abdul Rahman, and Juremi Hassan were found guilty of murder and sentenced to death by hanging. Following the pronouncement of the sentence, Mona expressed her contentment with the verdict to the press, stating, I am pleased with the decision and I am grateful to Malaysians, and then she blew kisses to the onlookers. Subsequently, all three convicts were moved to the death row section of Kajang prison in Selangor to await their execution. As per the accounts of prison officers, Mona was a model prisoner who engaged in reading the Quran and performed Islamic prayers five times daily. On the eve of their execution, Mona and her co-defendants were served Kentucky Fried Chicken as their final meal. In the early hours of November 2, 2001, Mona, Afandi, and Juremi were executed by hanging at Kajang prison. A prison authority reported that the trio showed no signs of regret during the execution carried out before dawn. It was noted that Mona, during her execution, calmly voiced the phrase AKU Takan Mati, 
which translates to, I will never die, and maintained her composure and smile. Anti-death penalty movements including Amnesty International expressed their disapproval of the execution of the three individuals. The trial of Mona Fandi was also among the final jury trials held in Malaysia. The high-profile and sensational nature of the case played a role in the government's decision to abolish the jury system. If you or someone else are affected by the content, it's important to reach out to a trusted individual or professional for support and guidance. We humbly invite you to hit that like button and subscribe to our channel for more similar content. That's all for today. Thank you for watching.